Good morning. What a wonderful, happy Sabbath indeed it is. Well, we are here, and we're very <laughs> glad to be here. It's um, April, the middle of April, hard to believe. Um, but as we're looking at the everlasting gospel, let's invite the Spirit to be with us. Heavenly Father, as we begin this lesson, we are asking for your spirit to be in our hearts, in our minds, in our words, and all that we do and say. That's really what we need all the time, but we're asking for a special measure right now so that as we go through this message of everlasting gospel, that we will represent you in a way that will draw others close to you. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation 14 talks about the everlasting gospel. You know, I always thought that, till this week actually, really, I always thought the everlasting gospel was, you know, this plan of salvation and whatnot. But this lesson kind of goes in a different tangent that I really hadn't thought of before, but I hadn't thought of that as being the gospel. But anyway. Okay, so we're going to look at the yeah. memory text. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Globally, literally. Yes. To A global message. Teaching it to the world, preaching it to the world, everlasting gospel. And the lesson points out that, uh, in the introductory portion there, that, that it's, the angel, of course, is coming and... Um, doesn't say proclaiming here, but having the everlasting gospel to preach. And it goes into Old Testament, Deuteronomy there at the beginning, that, you know, O oh, hear, O oh, oh, Israel, hear, O oh, Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one, which is a familiar chant or psalm or song sung at most or at all traditional Jewish services. And it has a special name, Shema, they call it. And the lesson the authors go on to point out that Shema actually means hear. So, you know, hear, O Israel. Hear, O Christian. Hear, O man. Hear, O woman. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And then, of course, the authors tie in the Seventh-day Adventist Shema, our Mantra, cry, so to cry. speak, yes. is the third angel's message. It identifies who we really are. And the next to last paragraph at the bottom of page 22 on the, on the standard quarterly, or page 31, the teacher's quarterly, if you're following along, is um, our identifying statement of faith. It tells who we are, what our mission is, and our unique preaching of prophecy for end time in Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12. You know, I was trying to decide if we should read that, and I think I want to read the whole thing first. We'll touch back on it. All of Revelation it. 14 or those no, verses? No, just those verses. All right. I was going to say, okay, this is going to be a long lesson today, or a very short lesson after the reading of the Revelation. <laughs> no, but I I would like to do the 6 through, uh, the 6 through 12. 12. 6 through 12. 6 yeah. through 12. The lesson is Revelation. No, I'm sorry. Anyway. Chapter 14 of yeah. Revelation. Starting with verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying mid-heaven with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Boy, it's a lot of T's. Alliteration. And he said in a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is, has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. Another angel, a second following, saying, Fallen, fallen, is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of her impure passion. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and has its image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also shall drink the wine of God's wrath, poured unmixed in the cup of his anger, and he shall be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, 
and they have no rest, nor day or night, these worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is the call of endurance for the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord here henceforth. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. And this is, oh, that was one verse too many. But anyway, but as we look at that, and I thought about this section of Revelation. Three angels each... With a message that's loud. They must have been hard in here. Well, Kevin. Graham Maxwell must have been right. Yeah, but looking at the, at the, to me, the three angels basically say the same thing. It's a message of, you have a choice. Fear God or follow the world. Those are your two choices. There's not... There's not a... There's no middle ground. We, there's we, no we middle ground. We talked about that last week. Yeah. And that's so true. And the third angels, the three angels message is an end time message, of course, because the everlasting gospel is to be preached. Babylon has fallen, come out of her. And those who are righteous keep the testimony of Jesus and, and um, keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus, the two parts. So when we look at Revelation, Revelation starts out in, in verses 1 through 3. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. I think about when that was written thousands of years well, ago. Well, again, soon is a relative term when we're told that a blink of God's eye is a thousand years. I know. And he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads aloud the words of the prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written therein, for the time is near. As I look at this, I, I think, wow, how true that is. Um, never before... Have we quite seen the same the same things happening that we're seeing now? And I I truly believe the time is near. Always it's been near, depending on where you lived, you know, what the circumstances of the people around you. We know many people, you know, passed away or were killed as martyrs or Whatever. So, grace. Well, Sunday's lesson, again, reiterates that the book of Revelation is all about Jesus. And I would, again, and I probably should look more carefully at the actual title, encourage you, if you want, to understand how Jesus is in the book of Revelation, look for the book by one of the Tuckers, T-U-C-K-E-R, I believe it's called Finding Jesus in Revelation. But the very fact that the message of the last book in the Bible <clears throat> is the message of Christ delivered from sin's penalty and its power. Revelation is all about Jesus. <clears throat> Excuse me. Should have probably had a glass of water with me or something. But in any case, you know, and I, I it's the fact too that as the last part of the Three Angels' message uh, is that we have deliverance from sin. Those who will be delivered are those who, again, uh, have the testimony of Jesus and keep the commandments. We're delivered. Yeah. So if we go to 1, Revelation 1, 5 and 6, and from Christ Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of earth. So identifying who is it that is is ruling and to him who loves us and has freed us from our sin by his blood well that's very plain and the verse six and made us a kingdom priests of his god and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen 
when we when we think about that, that's it's a done deal. That's what Revelation well, says. It was a done deal when Jesus came forth from the grave. It was yeah. a done deal. So, and that was you know a good number of years ago. Freed us from his sin. From with, our sins. From our sins by his blood. Right. He right. took the penalty we deserved. And the lesson points that out later has a really interesting turn. I think I marked it, so I'll share it with you guys if you if you didn't discover it yourself this, this week as you study. But, you know, there's hope, too. Despite the, the things that come later in the book of Revelation, the fact that there are overcomers and that they are... They are protected and they are taken care of. Because Jesus has always promised to see us through. No matter what it is, he'll see us through. Yeah. It doesn't provide or, or, or produce miracles to get us out of, but promises to see us through. And that gives you hope and strength and courage to, to continue on by faith. Well, and recognizing that <clears throat> in, the, in the Bible, in this section of the Bible... We often think about the end of time, and people get worried and scared. And I know when I talk to my students, you know, they've heard a, a sermon or two about the end of time and, you know, all the struggles, and they'll lose all kinds of things. Anyway, they, they will come and ask questions. And I said, what you need to be looking at is, and I think, I think this is what Satan does really well. He goes, look over here. This is so dangerous over here. You know, the beasts, they're going to be terrible. You're going to be tortured. Your life will be horrible. And and you'll be persecuted and martyred. And, and God's over here going, I'm with you. Don't be afraid. I've done everything. You have a home with me. You're saved by my blood. And if you keep my commandments, and have my love. You'll be saved. And it's, you know, it's literally, you know, that that idea of watch this hand. And God saying, no, just hold my hand. And so I, I talked to them about that, the grace-filled book. Rarely do people look at Revelation and go, ah, oh, it's about God's grace. That's not, it's the end well, of time and things time, are going to be It's like bad. the last warning, so it is grace, no matter how you look at it. If you, yeah. if you look at terms of what grace is, of course, grace is God's attitude toward us that we don't deserve. And yeah. Monday's lesson has the, the critical statement that I was talking about, that the fact that Christ died the death that we deserve yes. so that we might live the life, so that we might live the life that was his, that is his. Wow. And that's exactly what it is. You, you know, we talked, <clears throat> I think, last week about the fact that when, in the investigative judgment, when your name comes up, if you're on Jesus' side, it's not, it's your name, but it's Jesus' record in the book. You know, he died the death that was ours so that we could live the life that is his. What a powerful statement. God's grace is unmerited, it is undeserved, and it is unearned. There's nothing we can do to, for any of those. It's all undone for us. Well, Monday talks about the everlasting <coughs> gospel. And I think about the everlasting. God's everlasting. So, of course, it's an everlasting gospel. And the lesson does not just everlasting into the future, but into the past as well too exactly bringing us to the remembrance that this this uh plan of salvation this gospel message wasn't oh these new creatures called humans sinned we better have a plan to save them no um the everlasting gospel was put into works or discussed and laid out not into not working yet because no one sinned prior to probably any creation of sentient beings so that word if, right, sentient? Yeah, I think or it's close it to I No, sentient. Uh, okay, yeah, First that Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. I want to look at that, and then I want to look at Romans, if you would. So First Corinthians 15. I'm going to just <clears> kind of <throat> jump in, because he talks about, you know, 
I, I've preached to you, Paul is saying, I've preached to you this gospel, which you received, and by which you're saved. And he says, For I deliver to you as the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, in accordance with the scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and he appeared more than 500 to 500 brethren at a time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So he's, he's saying, this is real. I have preached to you. This is what the message is, that Christ died for our sins. The scripture said that had to happen. He was buried and raised. Rose. He rose he under rose. his own power. Well, he was raised on the third day. Well, yes, his, but it was his... Never mind. I know. It's a different discussion. I know. Different but topic. But if we look Very at that, one, that great hope <clears throat> is that Christ's death and resurrection was for our benefit. So if we jump over to Romans, which isn't very far from Romans Corinthians. Romans 3, going backwards. Romans 3, and we're going to look at verse six. 24 to 26. Oh, oh, that's right. Romans 3, not Romans 5. Yeah. Romans 3, verses, verses 24 through 26. Okay, and it says the almost the exact same thing. <clears throat> it says, they are justified by his grace as a gift through redemption which is in Christ by whom God put forth as an expiation I love that word expiation by his blood to be received by faith this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins it was to prove the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies him who has faith in Jesus. Wow. That last sentence or phrase is quite powerful. I want to read expiation. Theologians have argued whether there is a difference between expiation and propitiation. In this passage, Paul uses the Greek word um, which is also used in Hebrews 9, 5, translated mercy seat. Some interpreters see a distinction between expiation and propitiation in that the former refers to the ritual satisfaction of sins committed, or the latter has to do with the person who was offended. Anyway, it goes on to talk about the atoning sacrifice and that it is in that event that God and man are reconciled. And so I I was taught. And that atoning sacrifice, expiation. of course, is Jesus' death yes. on the cross. Well, he died on the cross. The cross didn't kill him. But that, again, too, is a lesson study in, in all of itself as well. Well, and recognizing <clears throat> it was the fulfillment of Scripture that was so significant in that. All right. So now 5, 6 to 8. While we were still weak, this is the one I, I identify with. While we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Why? One will hardly die for a righteous man, hmm. <clears throat> though perhaps for a good man, one will dare to even die. And then the verse 8, But God shows his love for us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is the eternal gospel. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because the plan was... It's all about love. <clears throat> the plan was set in motion, though not put into effect, before earth, certainly before earth was created, if not... All beings created the beings that had the power to choose which is what love really is is having that power to choose to do and to be you know they say love conquers all but love is not a conquering force love may entice all love may woo all but say love conquers all kind of an oxymoron 
you know, jumbo shrimp. Yeah. Um, when you look at at I can't think of any more right now. Christ's grace. We um the 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 lesson talks about it being unmerited, undeserved, and unearned. That Christ's grace, Christ's love offered to us. I, I read this and I keep hearing grace, 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 and I think love, love, love. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> It sounds like a good but, start for a song. Yeah, it does, doesn't <clears throat> it? But I think one of the things that really um, hit me was the idea of Christ took on the Father's wrath. At once. Not little by little, but it was given to him, dumped upon him, poured out upon him, whatever you want to call it, as, well, it started in the Garden of Gethsemane, but it continued through Friday. and But God's wrath is itself. to withdraw his presence. And that caused such an utter darkness at the noonday that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, they say. And let sin have its way. And that sometimes... When we see the story of the cross, you know, this last weekend, so many sermons, so many things done about, you know, Christ's death on the cross. But the, the part that was the hardest was when God's wrath was poured out. Sometimes people think it's the crucifixion that is God's wrath. No. But God's wrath was that pulling away and letting sin go to its final completion and recognizing that that is such a different message from what so many people believe about Christ's death. Um, it wasn't the cross. It was the fact that... He, he had lost his father because he chose to take on our sin. And all the sins prior to Jesus' time, and all the sins since his time, and all, the, and all the sins of humanity until the angel comes forth from the temple and declares, He who is filthy, let him remain filthy still. He who is righteous, let him remain righteous still. Even so, Lord, come quickly. And Jesus is like, oh, is it time already? Oh, okay, I better go ask the Father about that. And then he comes with all the redeemed. And we're told that it was a multitude of people who were raised with Christ on Easter Sunday who witnessed before his transfiguration and went to, up to heaven to those in Jerusalem. But the plan of salvation is the everlasting gospel. It has always been there in the past. We certainly enjoy it in the future, and uh, in the present rather, and, and will in the future, and not enjoy it like we take it out and look at it and ogle, ogle over it, but realizing that it is truly the, the pearl of great price, that we... We are that pearl. We are able to partake of Jesus' sinless life by accepting his free gift of grace and salvation, for which he is the... <coughs> oh, now we're changing sneakers. Yes. Did you get that one? I've been waiting for that all day, however. Um, oh. He's, yeah, the he sages is our, are he, coming he out. He is angry. our substitute. Yeah. Just as the ram was substituted for Isaac on the altar, Jesus is our substitute on the altar. And that plan of salvation has been in place forever. So Second Timothy 1.9... Uh, that's Second Timothy one nine. Give you probably can there, you can probably know this one. I learned this many years ago. Um, who saved us by saved us and called us with a holy calling, not in virtue of our works, but in virtue of His own purpose, purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus ages ago. Now I I was thinking about that who saved us and called us with a holy calling. And that's, that's H-O-L-Y, not W-H-O-L-Y. 
Yeah. But I was I was thinking about that. The everlasting gospel. We are a part of the everlasting gospel. It's part of our response. And um, you can look at Titus. You can look at Ephesians. Um, when I went to Ephesians um, 1, 4, and it's one that I memorized, you know, when I was quite young. Um, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. The only way that we can be holy and blameless before him is if we have taken on Christ's righteousness. So the everlasting gospel goes on to become part of the story of grace. The lesson before we move on to the story of grace on Tuesday. Yes. Just want to grab the four points in Romans that says we're justified, of course, by grace. Yeah. Free grace, too. That grace is the, the declaration of God's righteousness and grace justifies those who accept Jesus by faith. And God's love is demonstrated, as you read to us, even as we were sinners. Yeah. So the story of grace. Part of the three angels' messages is the story of grace. You know, we see it when the Savior is expressing his love, his unmatchless love. And, you know, one, one common uh, present-day Bible teacher, scholar, we call him by the name of Alistair Begg, says that God loves us completely and knows us thoroughly. And yet he loves us still. That's awesome. Um, God knows truly what and who we really are, and he still loves us. Yeah, um, that's true love for um, what we know. I um, I was reading Revelation uh, 13, 8, and, you know, a lot of the, of the verses go back to Revelation, um, but Revelation 13, 8, and how it fits with God's purpose. You know, the best part about God to me is that everything he's done has purpose, right? It's the purpose of all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world, the book of life, of life of the lamb that was slain. So recognizing that we are there and um, God has called us. The everlasting gospel as we ta- as said several times throughout this study, is past, present, and future. It's everlasting. No beginning, no end, because it's part of who God is. Yeah. And in that love, and I highlighted one portion, uh, about two-thirds of the way down the page, about middle of the third paragraph, love requires choice. And once beings are given the power of choice, the possibility of making the wrong choices exist. So So knowing that, God had to have a plan already to go, so to speak, before those beings would be created, so that with that freedom of choice, if they did choose to rebel against God, there'd be a way to restore the relationship. Recognizing that... um First Peter talks about, um, you know, you were ransomed. First Peter, 18, First Peter one eighteen. Yeah, you know that you were ransomed um, from the feudal ways inherited from your father. <laughs> I like that, and not with perishable things like silver or gold, but your father's um, not with perishable things of silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like the Lamb without blemish or spot. He was destined before the foundations of the world, but was made manifest in the end of times for your sake. And through him, you have confidence in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Um, So I know, but I wanted to read that last part. When I, um, I don't know, I was reading somewhere and then um, I, one of my friends sent me a little thing because we had been talking about Um, Christ and his unblemished. We often look at our world today and, 
you know, everything has a blemish. You, <laughs> you get the perfect organic fruit, but it has a blemish because it's organic and we can't possibly, you know. Anyway, another story. But um, my friend sent me this video and the pastor was talking about the, um, the prophecy that he would be born in a manger. And they were talking about I always had thought that it was a place where they put hay, but it wasn't. The manger that they're talking about was a hollowed out stone that they would wrap the lamb in cloth, swaddling cloth, and they would keep it there unblemished. It would be fed and cleaned and cared for and nurtured and... Well, it can't be too nurtured in a stone trough, dear, but... Well, no, but, but they would keep it there, and they would wash it just like a baby. And it would be the lamb that would be unblemished. And they kept it in this rock manger so that it wouldn't hurt itself. It wouldn't be hurt. It would be unblemished. And they would care for it and love it and feed it can you imagine then having to sacrifice it having to sacrifice it and the the pastor was talking about that Christ Christ was that unblemished he was wrapped it was all part of prophecy to me the prophecy was that he would be born in a manger it wasn't that he would be cared for and put in the same place that the sacrificed lamb was placed. Well, hence this title, Lamb of the World. Uh, and in your reading, Lamb of the World, who takes away the sins of the world. Exactly. Lamb and I just, I was so astounded with that, that it was, it was a deeper part of the prophecy, not just a service. You know, I'm thinking a little place and the little lammies come up and it's, you know, a nice little wooden soft hay to be on. And, well, except you for, know. you know, not on by cows and horse saliva and cow yeah, saliva. But it was know, anyway. a stone <laughs> hollowed out. And I, uh, yeah, the, the depth of God's, to show it's real, to show that, this is a purpose. I have a purpose in every prophecy that I've given. Um, Ellen White says, The plan for our redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall. It was a revelation of the mystery, which has been kept in silence through times eternal. Um, it was the unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. The foundation. That's, that's Everything deep. rests upon the foundation. And we've been chosen. We've been chosen by him, called, a holy calling. And are we responding? Well, that brings us to the response, which is going into all the world in Wednesday's lesson. And the authors of our lesson seem to fill at the fact that in doing this, we are reaching out to a larger community, and that is what many people feel they have. They have a calling, is the fact that it's something far greater than themselves that they are part of and taking part in. And it's these uh, events, so to speak, and this way of looking into all the world that our job is to go to preach the gospel in all nations, all peoples, all those who speak different languages from what we hear and understand, that human beings want to and are eager to join a group that is in their interest group, of course, but is moving forward by the addition of members. You know, having, having friends is great, but if they don't share some common interests, they don't say friends very long, because what do you have to do? What do you have to talk about? What can you, what can you do? So the authors take a book by uh, David Paul Tripp called A Quest for More, Living for Something Bigger Than You. And part of my lesson study, that came up 
as something from a museum or something. I don't remember what exactly it was, but it blocked, the computer blocked it. And so I'm so happy to see that here in, in the lesson and we're able to, to go with it. I, you know, I was reading the, the part of Matthew that kind of dovetails on, on this message of, of the gospel, go therefore and make disciples, right? Of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, for lo, I'm with you always to the close of the age. And I was, I was looking, my Bible talks a lot about different things, different aspects of that. Um, but it looks at the concept of a trinity and how there's, um, you know, God, when we understand his three parts here and we look at how it dovetails um, with, with revelation, um, it's so exciting to me to recognize that within the Trinity, there is each part plays a, a how can I say, each aspect of the Trinity. I don't I don't know because it's three in one and they're acting as one. But each part plays a role in our salvation, right? In how we see the end, how we um, visualize the end, right? God says it's time, Jesus on his way, and it's only happened through the Spirit. Those who will be saved through the Spirit. You know, the Son died on, the, on Calvary. Father had sent his Son. And then the Holy Spirit seals and dwells within the individuals each playing a an integral part of salvation and what what will happen and recognizing that it is that that we need to be telling more and more right so are you ready to go on to thirsty Mm, we're running pretty fast here. Thursday lesson, only 37 minutes into our recording. Okay. Trace now will sing a song at this point in time. No, no we're I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, because music on this lesson. Yeah. But Thursday's Thursday's lesson looks at the Adventist Church, or I should say the Advent message, and how we were established really as a missionary church. Now, Tracy and I are both teachers, and the schools that were established in early Seventh Adventist history were not for elementary or high school students, but to train missionaries, to train to train pastors and preachers, the those who would go out and spread the news of Jesus' soon return, the three angels' message, the mission, proselytizing, baptizing. You know, Jesus said, you know, here's here's what I want you to do. It's found in Matthew twenty four. You know, go ye into all the worlds, baptizing all men, teaching them the things that I've taught, making them disciples. You know, teaching, I think it's teaching and then baptizing. Remember, it's baptizing, it's baptizing, baptizing and then teaching. Baptizing and teaching. And the mission movement, it talks here a little bit, I think this is where it talks about uh, John Andrews and what an amazing man he was for until his intellectual abilities and so forth. Our first, said that as church's first missionary uh, to Europe of all places. Europe had had an earlier revival in the 1700s. Yeah. And here's America in the 1860s or so, sending Americans back to Europe to proselytize. Well, and you know what? It was what? to proselytize the Third Angel's message. It wasn't just Christianity. Well, it's always so interesting to me. When I was teaching at Upper Columbia Academy, one of my students, her dad had come to America to be a missionary. Mm -hmm. That was very odd to me. I was like, this is America. We don't need missionaries. I, I don't know. I don't know why that hit me so weird. But then I, I began to realize that there were people who went from this country to this country 
And that, it that was pen, like, I'm sorry. I'm really nervous too. Okay, I'll put around it down. all evening. Thank you. Um, recognizing where the, the people were going to be missionaries. And then I thought, okay, our holy. Put that pen sorry. down. You know, I'm going to take it out of your presence. <laughs> I'm going to save myself a slash with a sharp ballpoint No, pen it'll here. just be a little red. No, it won't. Okay. It'll be a wicked star. Okay. When we look at going well, as a but missionary... We're also told the home is our first mission front. So yeah. we have mission all around us. It's not foreign mission. It's not uh, within the nation. It starts in your home. It starts in your home. But that, again, too, is a... Another topic for another day. Thursday's lesson deals with the mission movement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So I was looking at Acts 1-8. All right, Acts 1, verse 8. You shall receive... I can read more verses if I want. No, you can't. I'll take... But you shall receive power. Um, sorry, I can't read when I laugh. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And you know what's interesting? The apostles couldn't do that until after they had the Holy Spirit as symbolized by tongues of fire upon their head. After they became one accord. After they became one in spirit of what their mission was and how they were going to spread the gospel as directed by Jesus before he left. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen until their hearts were ready. Forty days after Jesus left the earth at the day of Pentecost was when this happened. And then had the great <laughs> preaching by Peter where thousands were baptized in one day. The t speaking of tongues, how amazing it must have been. Mission movement, though. It said that the church sent their first mission missionary in eight, 1874 to Europe uh, with his uh, John uh, Andrews took his two daughters, and they, I believe, remained there the rest of his life. Don't know what happened with the daughters. Of course, I wasn't around in the 1870s and 1880s. In spite of what your children think. Well, in spite of what I tell them, but that's beside the point. Another lesson altogether in that as well. And of course, there's one reason, and only one reason why people choose to be true missionaries, whether they're missionaries that are given a missionary commission through the general conference or volunteer missions or missionaries or talking to your neighbor, right? It's one reason, and that's because Jesus loves us so much that he took our place, our place of eternal death, and he's coming back to take us to heaven to live eternally with him. And we can't stop sharing that. Now, the this first missionary, brilliant man. The lesson tells us that... Go ahead. Oh, I thought you wanted to share no, that. No, go ahead, because I have something else to share. Oh, okay. The lesson talks about him having not just command of, but fluent in seven languages. Of course, once they say you learn three or four, the rest come easily. But I don't know about I don't that. Know about that. Uh, not only that, but that, that he <laughs> memorized the entire New Testament and could repeat it, and almost the entire Old Testament. Now think about that for a minute. Mem Unless he had truly had a photographic memory. Which would be lovely, by the way. Well, until it gets too full and you can't get the memories out, and then it's all a jumble, but that's beside the point. And uh, wrote prolifically, we're told, a powerful preacher, a competent theologian, truly the best man that the newly, newly formed Seventh-day Adventist Church had to send. They sent J.N. Andrews. I don't know what the N is, but John Andrews. Maybe Nichols or something. That's a, yeah. that's a good Adventist uh, name, Nichols. Yeah. That goes far and wide in early Adventist history. And he truly worked the rest of his life in Europe. And he didn't have that long to live. But that's neither here nor there either and then the lesson finishes the, uh, for the day that today's last or end time uh, missionaries aren't perhaps people of this nature but 
They are the teachers, the medical personnel, pastors, farmers, mechanics, carpenters, tradesmen of all type. Not necessarily denominational employees called or credential ministry missionaries, but people who believe that Jesus is coming soon. Well, and to do all that they could to spread that news. When we look at Matthew, I was I was going back to Matthew twenty four. Um, 14. This is one that we've heard often. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, which means we need missionaries who have a testimony. And we all should be, we all should be working on our testimony, talking about what God has done for us, show, being able to show other people how God is alive and working in our lives. And then the end will come. I was, um, you know, I think I've talked about this before, but as we as we look at this preaching, the everlasting gospel, we cannot do anything of our own. God has given us a testimony through our experiences. For some people, it might be a disease that they've had to deal with. Everything from one that might be just annoying and discomforting to, you know, that one that might actually eventually be fatal. But recognizing that that is a testimony. How you live with God during that time. You know, Paul often talks about that that thing that plagued him. We don't know what it was, but... That thing that the plagued thorn in him. His side. Yeah, exactly. Um, for others, it might be out and out miracles. Um, one of my high school um, summer camp friends uh, was in a plane crash, and he lived. And it's a small um, plane crash too. Yeah, and he was unconscious in San Diego for quite a while, and when he finally woke up. You know, several of us, I've been going down from Glendale. I just barely moved to California, and I'd been driving to San Diego a couple, three times a week um, to try to talk to him and encourage him and bring him uh, awake. And um, I think about um, people who have had, you know, things weren't working out, their businesses were falling apart, and they fell apart, but God help them find a new way. This last weekend, we had um, alumni at Newberry, and it was wonderful. We had a panel of, of speakers instead of just one long sermon. Uh, we had a panel of speakers who talked about how God had led in their lives, and they had that amazing testimony of what God can do if we engage with him proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming God's love, um, living his grace so that others can see how great is our God. And we look at that today and we ask ourselves, how can it go to all the world? We have machines and translators today that can translate into the most remote languages and they're recording sermons in those languages so that you don't even have to know the language you can just take it and let people listen to it and they can come to God they're longing to hear this message of grace and that is happening you know last week's lesson talked about the 700 um warriors in the South Philippine island of Mindanao, who, through the radio, and Adventist World Radio, stopped being rebels, gave up their weapons, and were baptized. So we see that happening continuously. The very end of Thursday's lesson kind of is, I don't want to say it's bragging, but, you know, going the message going to all the world, and the everlasting gospel 
Adventism has a presence in 210 of the 235 recognized countries of the world. Yeah. Recognized, I say, by the United, not United Nations. So we know some countries exist that aren't recognized as countries by the United Nations. Uh, we won't go into that because that's politics. But, and I know we have a presence there because we have some schools there. And that's, I'll just leave it at that. That's only 25 nations that we are not have a, an official presence in. Some of those nations, proselytizing Christianity is still capital punishment. So we don't have an official presence in those countries. But, but radio there is and some other ways. Christian Adventist um, proselytizing going on even in those countries that I know about. So, yes, and of course, world radio and other things. And I find one of my favorite way of proselytizing is is the people on one border get white gr plastic grocery bags and write scriptures on them and then fill them with helium and send them over the border. And wherever they land, there's scripture for that person if that's something that they're interested in. And the, the people get it, memorize it, and pass it on. Get it, memorize, pass it on. They don't even, they just memorize it so they have it because they know that it will be taken away. At some point, and you could be punished with it. So they just memorize it. We we don't take that time. Um, it's the end of the lesson is so. You know, I was reading through that great controversy. It's so powerful when you read the end of great controversy, and the end of time, and the the miracles and the things that will be wrought. We are seeing that today, and it's powerful um, to recognize that the Spirit of God is going full force, and are we even recognizing it? Are we, are we paying attention, or are we just doing our Laodicea thing? Well, we need to be keenly attuned to God and His speaking to us to be able to know that and to have that understanding and and desire you know sometimes our prayers maybe need to be lord create within me the desire to do your will yes so that it's not mine but yours and jesus kind of had that prayer yeah. uh, his prayer though was anything but this but i'll do what you want and you know, I, one definition of faith is to bet everything you got on God and, and follow His plan. You know, and that's, that's challenging for us, especially here in America where we're comfortable. Yeah. Where, where there's comfort from sickness, from lack of food, from lack of shelter, where there's a high level of What's the consumption? We are in need of not like Laodicea. But we don't have to be. Yeah. We don't have to be. But more and more, we're seeing the split between good and evil. And it's becoming very obvious. Satan's becoming more obvious. And God is calling. And the last part of this, um, you know, the holy, the people will hasten from place to place pro to proclaim the message from heaven. Thousands of voices all over. The warnings will be given. But this last one, thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. And that's what God's calling us today to do, to take a stand. As we finish our lesson study, the lesson says, just have, as you've discussed with your class, how are we doing this? What are our efforts? What efforts has God blessed? In Sabbath school, in our church, in our neighborhoods, how has God blessed? How has he led? How does he want to lead us? And are we sharing? Let's end with prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you for preserving this message through the years of always having your remnant, whether it be the, the early 
sons of God, whether it be those in the Dark Ages who uh, suffered great punishments through the then-Christian church, uh, before it was a Christian church, of course, political in Rome and so forth, in the Dark Ages, you've always had your remnants. And Lord, I pray now that as time draws near an end, we will be drawn to join in those who are proclaiming the last three angels' message, the go everlasting Amen. gospel, to hasten your soon second coming so that we can go to heaven, home with you at last, in perfect glory and live eternally with you. May these lessons quicken our spirit and light our, the Holy Spirit within us that we may truly, truly bring forth your second coming, not of our mean, but be part of that group that is preaching, so to speak, by word and by action, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Bless us this day, and until we meet again, whether it be in person or virtually here online, keep us safe and in your will, I pray. Amen. In your powerful name, amen. amen. Happy Sabbath, and um, we hope that you are enjoying these lessons. We look forward to next week.